looks like we have everybody here. So I will go ahead and um, convene the open session of this April 7th meeting of the San Lorenzo Valley Quarter District Board of Directors. Um, there are no actions to report from closed session. Uh, would you like to take the roll, Holly, for open session? President Mayhood? Here. Vice President Ackerman? Here. Director Fultz? Here. Director Smalley? Here. Okay. Everybody's here. Um, are there any additions and deletions to the agenda? Yeah, that's no. Okay. Um, this is the time then for oral communications from members of the public on items within the purview of the district that are not on the agenda tonight. Um, we're, we've got quite a number of attendees um, and Lawrence Ford has his hand up. So uh, go ahead, Larry. Hi, this is Larry Ford, Delton. I just want to remind the board that uh, it looks like fire season has begun and the Cal Fire is worried about it. And so I'm hoping that uh, the water district and others in our valley are getting ready by clearing combustible fuels around their homes and around all the water district facilities and that the district staff is going to be able to track any bias that are and uh, and also be able to do things like uh, run out to turn off valves in, in threatened pipelines and all that. Anyway, that's one of my main subjects around here. I'm starting to get nervous. Thank you. Okay. Rick, did you have a, want a quick response on what the district is doing to get ready for fire season? Um, am I muted? Yeah, well, you know, we're, we're definitely aware of the Cal Fire um, notices that they put out for the last couple of days, you know, we're pretty much ready going into to all seasons, and including fire season. Um, we definitely are, are, are aware of uh, the heightened alert, but we're not moving in any, you know, special direction right now. We're pretty much geared up for all seasons and all disasters. Amy, I see your hand is up. I just wanted to acknowledge Larry's concern. I, I happen to be in Southern California this week and uh, it's 100 degrees and the Santa Anas are blowing with a fierceness. So, um, you know, I, I, I hear you and, and I, I think that we are all, we all share your concerns and anything that we can do to um, further harden and protect ourselves, we should be doing. Huh? Um, if I'm not mistaken, um, aren't we executing on uh, grants that we receive to uh, clear vegetation from around um, higher priority uh, district facilities? I know the tank across from my house uh, got quite a um, got quite a clearing. It was pretty open now. Um, isn't that correct, Rick? Aren't we in the middle of that? Yeah, we you know we started that some time ago, and we are continuing. And we've had also you know we've uh, applied for additional grants, and we do have some additional grants. So that's just ongoing uh, preparedness. Um, uh, I was kind of thinking more of Larry's question of what we're doing, you know, just recently for uh, this recent because there have been several warnings issued uh, at the beginning of the week for, in particular this week, uh, the San Lorenzo Valley has canceled all outside burning. And there is a, there is a heightenedness, a level of heightenedness out there for this week, especially. Yeah, I understand that, but I think it's important for people to know, particularly since Larry asked about clearing around our facilities, that in fact, that is underway. And I don't know how many we've done in total, but it, it's more than a handful. Um, right, and and it, it and it will be an ongoing commitment uh, of mine anyway, and hopefully the boards as well. I, I believe it will be to make sure that we keep applying for grants and and finding money to do that kind of thing. So um, thank you, thank you for bringing that up. Okay, um, next is the president's report, which um, there's a hop. Go, go ahead, Mark. I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand up. I, I see somebody else in the attendees oh. who has their hand okay. up now. Uh, Nicole? Um, 
Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I don't know if this is the right time. This is Nicole um, Launderberridge from Brackenbrae. I just wanted to give the board an update on our FEMA efforts. Um, we did um, have two of our projects. Uh, Nicole, later. Neil, later. Nicole, can we do this later when we talk about? Oh, is that, okay. That's on our agenda. Oh, okay, so, this is just about our FEMA update. So never well, mind. Well, it, it's part of our agenda. And so what, okay. what yes. I'm planning to do um, is immediately after Rick and Gina talk okay. about the uh, um, the letters of intent, I will call on you. Okay, and I will also call on Sean, and so both of you can say something before we open up the discussion for this for the board. Is that all right? Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay, good. Um, anybody else among the participants from the public? Okay, then I'll just go to the president's report, which is since our last meeting, uh, it has been announced that FEMA for certain. Uh, catastrophes, including the one that we experienced with CZU, will be increasing the reimbursement rate from 75% to 90%. Uh, and of course, this is a huge, uh, huge thing for us. It's great news. Um, and it's especially great news given the sort of shock that we've had on uh, the increase in estimates of cost of what it will cost to replace the seven miles of pipeline that was burned. And um, so this, this is really important and we're very happy about it. Um, okay, so let's go to uh, unfinished business. The first item is consolidation of Brackenbrae and Bob. I, I just had a quick question on that. Um, in addition to increasing it to 90%, did they give any indication about whether that would cover um, upgrades to current uh, best practices or whether it's just a like-for-like -like replacement? Rick, do you know the answer to that? They, going back to the original applications, uh, Bob, there has been discussion and we do believe on the distribution system, that answer is yes. Uh, we haven't got a determination of where we're at on, you know, like the five mile pipeline and so forth. This increase from 75 to 90 percent was a CZU, uh, actually several disaster wide. Uh, we haven't had any real you know, sit down and discussion on that with them. Yeah, but that's a key one to find out. I agree. Okay. Um, so uh, Next up is uh, unfinished business. The first item is consolidation of Brackenbrae and Forest Springs. Um, District Manager Rick Rogers first. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, this item in front of the board uh, tonight is the binding letter of intent to consolidate uh, for Brackenbrae uh, for your review. Uh, no action is being uh, requested tonight on this item. We will be returning with a similar agreement for Forest Springs. We are in the process of working with the uh, representatives of Forest Springs. Uh, representatives from both Forest Springs and Brackenbrae are in the audience tonight. And with that, I'll ask District Council to uh, present this item to the board. Okay, go ahead, Gina. Okay, thank you, Gail. Thank you, Rick. Um, I, I, what I want to explain to everybody who's here is um, what it is that you're seeing in the board packet and what was sent out via, um, via email to the board members and posted to the district's website this morning. Um, so in the board packet, there is a letter of intent agreement with uh, Bracken Bray Homeowners Association. Um, the version that's in the board packet is uh, what was created after one round of comments with Bracken Bray between Bracken Bray and the district. Um, since then, I think that was uh, generated around the middle to the end of last week. Since then, we've been continuing to go back and forth um, with the HOA regarding comments on the LOI. Uh, we had another round of comments early this week, and then we got some more comments last night. Um, so uh, the board members all received this morning via email, and members of the public have the ability to access it from the district's website. Um, there is a red line that shows um, the changes, all the changes that have been made to the version of the LOI that's in the packet. 
And um, it's got in particular some information bracketed and highlighted that came from the comments that we got last night uh, that um, I, I think raises some issues related to how the district is gonna assist with FEMA projects for, uh, for Brack and Bray that warrants a little more discussion before we can get final on that language. Um, so if you see the brackets and the highlighting in the latest red line, that, that's the reason for it. Um, and I guess I just wanna note a couple of things as well. We sent a very similar initial draft of the LOI to Forest Springs and as uh, District Manager Rogers said, we're looking forward to, to working through whatever comments uh, Forest Springs may have on that draft. Um, and of course, these LOIs, while they are intended to be binding agreements, they are essentially preliminary agreements. They're almost like a, a binding term sheet that will help create the framework for a more complete consolidation agreement that will be coming in about six months that'll have a lot more details about um, projects and connections and um, uh, elements of the water system that would be transferred to the district in connection with the consolidation and those kinds of things. Um, so there will be a more detailed agreement to come. These LOIs, they are a binding agreement, but they are intended to, to establish a framework. And uh, like all agreements of this nature that the district enters into, uh, it is conditional upon the results of environmental review um, of necessity because the district can't commit to any particular course of action until um, an environmental review of the, the proposed consolidation is completed. Okay, thank you. That was, that was a good explanation. Um, I'll call on uh, Nicole now from Bracken Bray and go ahead and if you'd like to address uh, this the group. Okay, am I, am I unmuted? Yes, you are unmuted. Okay, okay. Um, first off, um, our board of directors have met twice over this um, letter of intent um, and most recently last night to approve the amended um, LOI with the red lines um, and it was approved unanimously by our board. Um, we have been actively working on this since we received it. Um, just under two weeks ago, um, we met with legal counsel, I believe it was in December. So um, we have tried really hard to get to an agreement to this um, working term agreement to get us starting to move forward. Um, we are quite anxious to do so since we, um, what I wanted to share during the public comments is that um, uh, Brack and Bray has made great progress with our FEMA. Um, we were able to combine two of our permanent work projects together. Um, and to get them obligated because they were over a million dollars. They had to go to Congress for approval. Um, we were able to secure before the 9910, um, just over a million dollars with the 9010 um, cost adjustment, we're at 1.265 million. And that money is based off of rebuilding our current water system. Um, what we did was we opted into the 428 alternative procedures and we had to accept a fixed cost offer by February 22nd, which was 18 months from the declared declaration of the disaster. Um, so we did that. So we're, we're quite happy with, with that. That's our system-wide um, recovery plan. And then the third project is dealing with mainline. So for us, what was important in this LOI was that, um, that the board of directors, along with um, San Lorenzo's staff, have an uh, understanding of the importance for us to meet our obligations for that funding um, with, the way that FEMA works, you have a maximum of 40 months with time, that's the time extended um, because all permanent work had a period of performance by February 22nd, 2022. That has since passed and we have not obviously started permanent work. You guys have not started permanent work, but from that date, you have to ask time extensions. So you have 40 months from the declaration of, of the disaster. So that language was really important. And that in that, um, yesterday after a series of going back and forth with the legal counsel, we got um, that term in there. And so we were requesting the best efforts of San Lorenzo to work with us to make our, you know, comply to our obligations for that grant. Um, this money is going towards the infrastructure to um, fix damage infrastructure from the fire. Um, that will be turned over to SLV. So um, when you look at that bracketed language, please note that that 
that is also benefiting SLV by inheriting our infrastructure, which will hopefully all be new by the time we get to this consolidation. So um, today I just wanted to let you all know that we do appreciate um, what Rick and Gina have done um, over the last week and a half and going back and forth with our um, red lines. Um, we take this very seriously. Um, we have been in the water business since the early 1900s. This is a huge step for us to move forward in consolidation and we wanna be proactive partners into it. And we feel comfortable with that letter of intent as it is um, written. So if there's any questions regarding the bracketed um, language or any of the red lines that you received, um, I'm sorry that it was at such a late date, but we have been actively um, being responsive to the, to the red lines that we have received from SLV. And so um, we didn't get that. We got the most recent red lines from SLV yesterday morning. We met during the day and then met with SLV at the end of the day. So um, in any case, um, we've had members who are present on this um, meeting to show that we are wanting to move forward with SLV. So if there's any questions about the language in there that's redlined, I would be happy to answer it. Okay. Uh, before we open up discussion with the board, let's, um, I think uh, Sean is here from Forest Springs. And would you like to uh, say anything? Sean, yeah. Yeah, can you guys hear me? We can. Okay. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, we here at Forest Springs, we're really excited to receive the letter of intent. Um, we currently have it being reviewed by an attorney, and we also will be putting it in front of our association um, for review and approval. Um, at the moment, we have not sent back a red line draft to SLV. Um, we don't feel like we will have a lot of changes, um, and we should be able to get that back over to you guys relatively soon. Um, what's most important to us is um, we have 128 connections in Forest Springs. Um, so we have a lot of association members and we want everyone to be able to review this document, understand it, um, answer any questions that come up um, before moving forward with it. Um, and, and that's basically where we're at at the moment. We just wanna make sure we have our association absolutely behind this um, and understanding um, how we're moving forward. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Yeah. Okay, so we'll open this up to the board to discuss it. And what I would just like to suggest for this discussion um, among the board and also among the members of the public afterwards is that we really, in this particular item, uh, should be focusing on that this is a legal document um, that allows us to move forward and not get um, too mixed up in the issues of where all of the ultimate funding is going to come, uh, which we can take up with uh, item B under unfinished business. And uh, I, from my own standpoint, I, I view the LOI, I've read the most recent draft and I find it entirely acceptable. Um, I recognize that some of the language might change slightly having to do with the mounts, um, but that's fine because this is not the final agreement. The final agreement is the consolidation agreement. Um, and by the time we get around to those, we'll have a lot more information about the dollar amounts for both costs and grants. But the important thing now is that we move forward expeditiously, both, uh, you know, as as Nicole argued strongly, um, and also to allow us to uh, start uh, doing some engineering studies and other things to move the process forward. Um, so I'll start with uh, Jamie. Did you have any comments or questions, Jamie? Um, yeah, thanks, sorry. Um, 
So I, you know, I, I, I will admit I'm traveling right now, so I haven't had a, an opportunity to read through all the red lines. Um, but one concern that I have, and it's, you know, less about the agreement itself and more about just the, the logistics of meeting the, the 40 month FEMA timeline that's outlined in, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, expenditures, um, we have a lot of work that we are already engaging. We, we are spread pretty thin. I, you know, I just, I, I, I want us to meet these timelines, but I'd love to hear from Rick whether he thinks that um, with everything else going on, that would be reasonable. Rick? We are planning to work with Rack and Bray uh, to meet uh, those deadlines. Um, as we sit down and start working on the consolidation agreement, we will outline what those FEMA projects are have a little better understanding exactly uh, what the FEMA projects are and be able to assign timelines and hopefully be able to um, work those in with our current project uh, schedule uh, on the consolidation. Okay, thanks Rick. All right, Bob? Uh, yes, um, following up on that Rick, uh, is, is there the, let's say things go completely sideways and 40 months comes along and we're not quite done yet. Is there extensions possible if we have made substantial progress and are really, you know, let's say we had another disaster, you know, next year and, and we just got sideways. How does that work? And that's a great question. And it came up in our discussions over the red line. You know, we believe so, but we don't have that in writing. So we must, you know, consider the 40 month deadline as the time frame. SLV has been successful in extensions before. You know, the key to FEMA is that you keep them in the loop. But, you know, right now, and, and given that, you know, Bracken Bray is the lead agency, uh, we're going to do everything we can to make that uh, 40 a month deadline. It's important. Yeah. Okay. I just, I just know stuff happens sometimes. So, uh, I you know, I just hope it doesn't all get yanked. Um, I did, I, I did, you know, I'm, I very much want to see this proceed. I think it'd be a good thing for the community. I had a few questions on the agreement and um, not too many, because I actually think this looks really, I, I did have a chance to go through the red lines and I thought it looked uh, really good. Um, there, there was one, um, phrase in here that I, I wasn't sure I was clear about. And this, it was bolded and it says that if the total costs exceed the amount of grant funding, the residents within the HOA will be expected to fund the difference. Um, is that a commitment that they will fund the difference? Gina, you want to parse that language? <laughs> But they, because I would, I, you know, at some level to be expected to is kind of mm, introduces maybe some ambiguity. And, and one of the things that's been a consistent policy here, for me at least, is that the community, the SLV community today, does not incur additional costs as a result of this consolidation. Right. And then thank you. Thank you for that comment, Director Fold. Um, the Bold language as written in a way is more of a disclaimer than an enforceable provision. It's letting the members of, of these two communities know that the district um, does expect that the difference is gonna be funded from the local areas and it provides the mechanism with which that will be done. Um, it isn't, I think it's fair to say that the way it's written isn't really a, a contractual, um, a binding contractual provision, but I think it sets forth the intent that we may try to effectuate through, you know, some more binding terms in the consolidation agreement. Um, and it certainly is a roadmap to how the district will approach the accounting for the costs of the project um, and any need to uh, proceed with a surcharge or assessments post consolidation. And so those assessments post-consolidation would be focused specifically on these communities. It wouldn't affect the broader 
community, and that, and that is something that they would agree to? Well, I, I can't speak for them, but I think we've been very clear um, in the discussions about the LOI as to what the district's position is, that these consolidations are, that the district expects that these consolidations will be funded predominantly via, via grant funding to the extent possible. Um, and then the difference will be the responsibility of the local communities uh, that are being consolidated. Right, and the Prop 218 gives us the flexibility to focus on a particular neighborhood as opposed to... Let, let, let's, right. Nicole's got her hand up, so I think she wants to respond to Bob and Gina's comments. Go ahead, Nicole. Uh, yeah, um, I think Gina did a really good job to represent the, the board um, concern about that and that boldness there. Um, we did have a discussion about um, how that was written. We had um, proposed different language, and then uh, Gina um, presented the constitutional change that happened under Prop um, 218 and 26. Um, we, Brackenbury, do not, um, we will manage our costs, but we do not want to be responsible for any other costs. And that includes SLV customers that will benefit from this. So that you have customers who currently have undersized pipes that are like two diameter and four. And so um, there is a sense of level of nervousness about um, this next topic on the, our next item on the agenda about the um, 2 million um, overage that Sandus has estimated. Um, but so in the sense of the way that Gina presented it, um, we don't find this to be binding, that we will be obligated to that. That will be worked out through consolidation. But that's why it's very important for the FEMA money that we have received, because it would be a part of this consolidation, improving the infrastructure, that we don't lose that money. And so um, for us, it is important that the LOI move forward in order for the board to move forward with the other contracts um, so that the money can be released for Sandus to go ahead and begin that engineering study and um, begin to get a true understanding of what those costs look like. So we all understand what that looks like. And then what, how do we attain that? Um, you know, we're committed to um, repairing the damage of the CZU lightning fire. We're committed to doing the technical spec upgrades that you guys want to do, but we are a small community. And um, a third of our community has lost their homes. Four Springs is of a similar situation where a third of their, their houses have lost. So there's not an endless amount of money to squeeze out of us. We're reasonable people, and that's why we put in language in there that we want to be a part, check in with, with the process um, about how we get to the final number, and then we figure it out. Um, so we understood Gina's intent by the boldness that SLV, the board, will not stand for any money being leveraged off of the existing customers. Um, but we also want this to be a reasonable project. So um, we want to work within that framework and then decide whether we can do this and how we get it done. So um, we are also very nervous about moving forward when we start seeing $5 million, how this grant um, for the DWR has increased. So we want to get, so it's important for Brackenbray to get this LOI approved so we can move forward with Sandus to get the engineering study done. We have to move forward to better understand what this project cost is going to look like and what's required. So that's all I wanted to say. But thank, thank you for that, uh, Nicole. I think that was very well stated. I think you make some good points about, you know, relative cost benefit to everybody. At some point, I, I'm going to want to see sort of a summary document that has the numbers, you know, the Gazintas, Gazautas, so that we can get a better handle on things, including what the risks might be should the, the project not go forward if any of the grant funds have been uh, have been ex expended. Um, there, there's also that part uh, as well. Um, I had a couple other questions. Um, oh, on the insurance. Um, did we have any minimums that we were saying that we were required or is it just whatever they have basically? Yeah, this, well, in, in my view, Director yeah. Foltz, we'll, we'll think about whether we need specific minimums in connection with the consolidation agreement. Mm -hmm. And this provision is just kind of a basic statement of intent that each party should keep 
sort of standard and reasonable insurance policies in effect during the term of the LOI, but we haven't gotten into um, exact amounts or um, uh, uh, being designated as an insignee on each other's insurance policies and that kind of thing. But we may need to get into that for purposes of the um, consolidation agreement before construction starts uh, to yeah. occur. Yeah, at some point, uh, I would think. And then the last question I had um, had to do with um, sort of operational expenses. It, it wasn't clear to me in the LOI, and maybe I'm, you know, I just missed it, uh, whether or not, for example, payments to Big Basin Water would be covered by the HOA versus um, the San Runs Valley Water District as part of this consolidation. I think it was implied that it was with the HOA, but I, I wasn't clear about it. Uh, well, the, the, this LOI isn't isn't providing for the district to take on any obligations with respect to meeting the HOA's obligations to Big Basin or any other contractual obligations um, at this time until any contracts may get assigned to the district at the closing of the consolidation agreement. But, but certainly not in the interim, the district wouldn't be assuming any responsibility for um, the well, HOA's my, payment obligations to Big Basin. My, my, my question, I think, had to do around the assumption of liabilities by SLVWD and the indemnity section, I think the new section eight. Um, and so by closing, we're talking about the, the, the final consolidation um, agreement. At that point, does the district take on all of the liabilities, including any big base of water invoices? Well, that, that is an area. Um, the, li the liabilities that are disclosed to the district, the LOI provides for the district to take on the liabilities that are disclosed to it and determined to be part of the water system that's transferring to the district. Um, those will have to be itemized in the schedules to the consolidation agreement. Um, I think that, that the HOA has told us that they don't have any contracts that would come over that would, you know, bring liabilities with it to Big Basin. So I don't. And so the final consolidation agreement would disclaim anything that wasn't disclosed. That is, yes, it's, that's correct. Right? Okay, yes. that, that's that's the main the main point that I wanted to, to make sure I was clear on. Um, okay, I, you know, I, I really think how are, we're not talking about taking action tonight. Is that correct? We're not voting on it tonight. That that's correct. When uh, would we vote? When would we vote on this? Would it be when Forest Springs is complete as well? Well, we're hoping to to get a red line from Forest Springs in the next week and given that it doesn't appear that there will be a great amount of changes tonight to, to the uh, LOI. Um, so I will discuss with the uh, board chair about possibly coming back with a, uh, at requesting a special meeting and possibly maybe um, and, and address more of this in uh, the next item about uh, grant funding. Yeah, I definitely want to, I mean, if a special meeting is needed to move this along faster, I, I would be open to it myself. Um, the, you know, the, one of the key things I want to learn about, Rick, is what happens if it, what's the downside risk if we start spending grant money and the project, for whatever reason, doesn't happen uh, for circumstances outside anybody's control, what happens then? And how is that, how is that funded? I have some answers in the next item. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, Mark? Yes. Um, for those that have not reviewed both the uh, the red line in the original letter of intent, I do want to express, um, I reviewed both in detail, and I feel that the amount of red lines that we received from Brack and Break are very limited and I think reasonable. Um, and I do want to note that the consolidation agreement that we're talking about the LOI was setting out a target completion of February or um, September 30th, 2022. Um, I would expect that a lot of the questions that we're asking, in particular about uh, 
funding amounts and as to how much we anticipate uh, Santa's is, is going to be, that we'll have a lot more of that information and we'll have more definitive information at that point from the Department of Water Resources. So uh, I'm viewing this letter of intent as we agree to work together for now. We agree that we're uh, going to develop this consolidation agreement. And a lot of the details are going to be defined in that consolidation agreement. So am I correct in that, Gina? I think that's well said, Mark. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's all the, uh, I don't have any further questions on that item. Awesome. I'm good with it. I think to me, it's a little bit more than just we agree to work together. Um, to me, this is really, um, it, it's like a commitment here. We're, we're getting engaged to get married here. I mean, it, it, this is a little bit more than just a, a regular LOI. Um, and, and so I, I, I'm taking this in that vein, that it is that serious and that we are that close to actually doing something to consolidate Forest Springs and Brackenbury. Uh, Nicole? Um, I'll just save my comments for this next item. I think everything's fine. Uh, are there, uh, I'll cycle back. Jamie, is there anything else you'd like to comment on this particular one before I go out to the public? No, uh, thank you. Okay. Um, so let me go out to uh, members of the public to see if there's any questions or comments. Larry. Go ahead, Larry. Sorry. Um, my number one comment is to say welcome to Brackenbray and Forest Hills um, as a, as a uh, water ratepayer from Felton. I can tell you that this process is very difficult and stressful, but we made it through. It took us about five years. And uh, the end result was very gratifying in many ways. Um, we now get to participate in the, the politics and the discussion of running the entire water board, which was way better than what we had before. And uh, we're really happy with it. We're participating. Um, we, do, we did have to take on a, a very significant bond. It was for $10 million. And that meant that uh, all of the property owners in Felton had to be prepared to pay, um, at the time, $500 a year uh, to pay off that bond. Luckily, rates went down, and uh, the county manager was able to get it down to about $450 a year. Anyway, we're paying for it. Um, it's uh, part of the property tax bill. It's not so bad, so I hope you guys can work all that out. Um, and I also want to just invite you at this point to get involved in uh, the board and the committees and, and to participate. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Any other uh, comments from members of the public? Okay, hearing none, seeing none. Um, we don't have any action on this. Bob, did you want to make one final comment on this before we go on to the next one? Yeah, Larry's uh, comments sort of prompted me to ask something. Uh, Rick, when the construction is done uh, in these areas, is, is this being done under prevailing wage uh, provision? Definitely. Thank you. Okay. All right. So uh, next we have... Uh, an item that uh, Mark Smalley uh, brought to the agenda, which is California Department of Water Resources grant for the consolidation of Forest Springs and Brackenbrae. Mark, take it away. Okay, thanks, Gil. Um, I've been the board representative involved in uh, discussions that the district has had with um, Department of Water Resources. Um, Rick has kept me uh, copied on email exchanges and other information that we've had at this point. Um, I put this together uh, because I wanted the board and the public to see the uh, draft um, agreement that we have from Department of Water Resources, but also the differences that 
um, that I'm seeing in funding that are that we have in the grant versus what I'm seeing as the uh, chair of the engineering committee, the Sanders proposal that was referenced um, earlier in our discussion um, as being uh, well above what the grant amount is. The grant amount that we have from Department of Water Resources for 3.2 million. The district requested 4.3 million, but the information that uh, we see in a recent proposal from Sandus Engineers uh, is indicating to me that the um, the amount could be more on the order of five and a half, five point six million. Um, and I think it would be uh, the the differences in this would be clear if we can pull up. Um, one page that's part of the agenda packet, and that's page 68. Uh, Rick, I don't know if... And, uh, Josh is going to pull that up. You can it do that. Josh or... made a presenter. Josh, are you going to pull that up? I am. Let's see. I don't see him as a presenter yet, though. There we go. Page 68. And let me maximize that. Okay. Um, with this, we can see the difference in design. We had requested 200,000. Santos came back uh, with a cost of 343. The district had solicited bids from engineering firms, we received five bids. Sandus was the apparent low bidder for that, um, 143,000 more. In addition to that, um, we want to look at task 4B, the construction. As part of Sandus's proposal, they provided an engineer's estimate of the construction costs. It's a one-page document that they included in their proposal. It's a very detailed list of what they anticipate would be needed from a construction standpoint. And as you can see, it's significantly more than the 2.7 million that was granted uh, by DWR, hence the difference between these two costs. The other difference that I wanted to uh, highlight for discussion was the schedule that we submitted versus what, uh, what we're going to be able to do. And that's on page 50. If we could pull that up. On your screen now. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, page 50 is the schedule. I think you've got 68 right now. Be showing 50. Let me see here. That's the only thing I've got up. Interesting. Let me stop sharing and start again and see what okay. happens. Um, the schedule shows that um, construction was going to start as early as May. Thank you. That's the, that's the schedule exhibit. Um, Design being completed by May 15th. Line item 4A, task 4A. Construction starting immediately thereafter. Um, we have not awarded a contract for the design yet, so it's not going to be completed by May 15th. Between these two differences, for what I was seeing in the grant amount versus what we're anticipating construction-wise and the schedule aspects, it was my recommendation that we request the district manager, Rick Rogers, to go back to Deep Web VR and discuss these in the uh, expectation that we would be able to expand the grant amount and better clarify schedule aspects. So with that, I think we could uh, open it up to questions. 
excuse me, Rick, why don't you go ahead and respond? Yeah, you know, and, and, and I, I want to uh, appreciate, appreciate Director Smalley uh, supporting moving this forward. Um, in anticipation to tonight's agenda item, I did uh, write uh, the State Water Board uh, or the DWR, Department of Water Resources, earlier in the week, pretty much outlining uh, Director uh, Smalley's concerns. Uh, I put in uh, a request for additional funds and request for uh, an ex extended deadlines. Um, the funding agreement has not been approved, so we still have a considerable amount of uh, discussion time with, uh, with the state. Uh, the state turned around and called me. We had an hour discussion this morning on that uh, uh, memo to them, and we discussed uh, the project in depth. Um, I don't want to get in into great detail of our discussions and our results of the discussions. I'll, I'll just say that we um, most likely can get uh, additional funds. Uh, extending the deadline will not be a problem. Uh, we talked about if for reasons we didn't finish uh, the project, uh, very uh, the same types of questions that Director Holtz has. I'm not in a position until I confirm those in writing with the state and get an answer back that they agree to uh, our discussion uh, to bring that forward to the board. Um, I will be able to uh, bring this to the board uh, when we bring back the uh, final agreements uh, on, uh, on final the final red line agreements. Um, I, I would ask if Director Smalley uh, doesn't have any objections that no action be taken by the board tonight as I already have written and made a request and we are in the process of uh, putting that now in writing uh, and we'll submit that to the board at the same time we uh, uh, bring back the agreements to the board. Okay, well, since you're already acting on what I was going to ask you to do, I'll withdraw the motion. Um, are there any questions, comments from members of the board? Bob? I, I do want to, I'm glad to see that the DWR might be willing to reconsider some of what I viewed as a very low ball <laughs> estimate on construction uh, in the original grant that was given. It's not that I want to be ungrateful about getting grant money because, you know, it, it is money that that sort of everybody contributes to, which is a great thing. It's like self-insuring. But, you know, those construction costs they came back with originally looked like they came from the Modoc Plateau, where, you know, things cost a lot less than they do here in the sort of greater Bay Area. So um, I'm hopeful that they'll give this serious consideration. I, I might also encourage us, given that construction may not start immediately, that maybe we ask for even a little bit more because construction costs seem to go up with that one exception on Quail Hollow is maybe a unicorn, but construction costs seem to be going up at a phenomenal rate, uh, you know, even month to month. So um, 5.6 may not be enough if that was their estimate they gave a month or two ago. By the time we get started a few months from now, we could be looking at even more. So yeah, th this, this is a real problem. And, and DWR wants to see this project go through. This project uh, is important to them as well as it is important to us. They realize the condition, uh, the drought condition and the CZU fire condition uh, that these two small districts have gone through. And I get the impression that, you know, they will work with the district and responding very quickly, as quickly as possible for them. And hopefully I will have most of your answers and Nicole's answers uh, within the next week when we uh, if we come back to you. Oh, that's great. I, I know they don't want to write a blank check, and I'm not asking for that. But that's been made clear. Yeah, but but and and I wouldn't expect them to do that, nor do I want ask them to do that. But reasonableness has got to prevail here if we're going to get this done. Mark. Yes, to clarify one point that Bob was making: um, cost escalations. Um, Sandus is. Uh, 
engineering and cost estimate does include an escalation factor, which accounts for the fact that you're they're estimating it now, but you're not doing the work now. You're doing the work as much as a, a year later based on their escalation factor. So uh, it's it can be, well, it can be debated if it's enough. We don't know that, but at least they've accounted for an escalation factor. I, I understand that. We had the same escalation with Lon Pico and what, what I anyway. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jamie, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, I, I think I'm willing to um, hold off on any comments until we are ready to bring this back for a motion after, you know, fuller discussion. So, yeah. Uh, okay. Any other comments by members of the board or Rick before I go out to the public? Just one quick comment. You know, um, uh, Dr. Ford made a comment that it took five years for uh, Felton to consolidate a whole different animal. Um, this will go much quicker. I don't want to give Nicole uh, heart failure. Um, we will do whatever we, we can to make our, our deadline and be done with our construction projects uh, as stated in the uh, LOI. Yes, please. Mark? Yes, I do have two questions related to the uh, DWR funding agreement. Um, on page 20, where they address invoices, uh, they make references to uh, timesheets as though uh, they expect us to allocate time to specific projects. Um, is district staff able, prepared to do that, Rick? Right now, you know, I, I haven't been able to uh, discuss this with Josh. I spent an hour on the phone with uh, DWR, and that is one of the ways, too, that we talked about potentially lowering some of these costs um, was if the district could. Um, if we get an in-house inspector, um, yes, I would say we could, but otherwise, uh, we really don't have bandwidth. I, I'm, not, I'm not expecting that. What I'm asking, for the time that any of the staff spend on the project, do we have the ability to essentially job cost or allocate 10 hours this week to a specific project? Yes. We okay. Can, we go by the hour sheets. by the 15 minute increment. Right. Okay. Good. That's correct. Glad to hear that. The other specific is on page 32. Uh, do we have a written policy for competitive bidding? Yes. Yeah. Okay. A written yes. policy. Okay. That we can provide. Okay. Good. And, and most likely, uh, we'll, I'll double check, but, you know, as, as council points out, DWR may have uh, their own uh, requirements as well, and I'll double check with that. They'll, they'll have one that they'll give us if we don't have it. And we do have a... I'd rather have ours and be able to write it to them. Okay, good. Okay, we, those, we are the, those are the only questions that I have on the DWR agreement for now. Good. Huh? We did a purchasing policy upgrade, I think, a year ago or so, a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. uh, long awaited, and it addressed all of that, which was really good work on the part good. of that. Good. Okay. Um, I'll go out to the public now. Nicole? Yeah, I so... Um, Two comments. Um, one, Rick, as you're working with DWR um, and you're trying to get them to do that increase, that term five on their funding agreement um, about grantee required cost share, um, that directly <laughs> relates to Four Springs and Brackenbrae. So if they're unable to um, increase that funding um, significantly, um, hopefully you can amend that language. Um, or previously, you had indicated that there was a verbal given by the DWR that they would cover um, over cost runs, and that's not how the contract reads now. So if we can seek written um, language into the agreement to support um, somebody telling you that verbally, that will help us significantly when we get to the consolidation agreement. I understand. And then, yeah. It would be difficult with them because they made it clear. I don't want to take a lot of time. Uh, we can, we'll can. we talk uh, when we talk again on the uh, LOI. No, no problem. And then the second th the second is um, from um, different, I think from you and from emails that I've read, they've encouraged you to um, move forward in the process for this project 
um, basically encouraging you guys the way I read it and I, at least how I understood your comments to go ahead and do engineering. And I understand the board's reluctant to do that without an agreement in place that um, during these discussions with them, if the board is not comfortable with the agreement that comes back, maybe there could be some type of agreement, at least for the engineering part to go forward so we can begin this process to have a better understanding of the dollars to get some agreement that if the board um, took on the financial risk for the engineering services that they would in fact be reimbursed for that portion. <laughs> And I, I feel after when we bring back your LOI that that will be covered. And I believe I would have enough information for the board to feel comfortable that the grant will cover engineering moving forward. Okay. And then the last comment, which I've, I've, I've shared with you, and I've actually told Sean this as well from Four Springs, but um, for Brack and Bray, um, it would be nice if for some reason, if something gets held up in this process, that the agreement would allow for some type of phasing. If for some reason, um, I, I look at it as three legs, but if we could get the two legs, your extension out to us and Brock and Bray in place to work along what we have to do with FEMA um, would be um, beneficial for all in regards to not losing the money that we have to do the infrastructure and construction. Um, if for some reason the four spring process because of the number of people in their community required to participate in that vote um, slows down the process because we've, it's been seven months since we started this discussion, and I, I you know, it, it concerns us at Brackenbray. All of our members have seen, um, every single member has seen this letter of intent, both in its um, initial red line and then what was presented to the board yesterday. We work very hard to keep our board informed, but it's a lot easier for us because we're much smaller and we can move quicker. That's all. Thank you. Huh? I, yeah, Rick, and while you're while you're working with the DWR, if they can maybe modify their clawback provisions a little bit to um, say not include engineering um, costs expended or what have you, I think that would also be helpful. Um, I, I just don't I just don't want them to be coming back and and grabbing money that it's hard hard dollar it would be hard dollar out of anybody's pocket, be it SLVWD or Brackenbray, as long as we are operating in good faith, trying to get this done. Agreed. Any other comments by members of the public? Uh, Nicole, did you want to say something else? Oh, no, sorry. Okay. Uh, any other me members of the public want to add anything? Okay, so um, there is no action item then. Uh, basically, Rick will report back on his discussions with DWR, hopefully, and also we'll have the Forest Springs Redline version, certainly by the next board meeting, but potentially even if we have it all together, we would have a special meeting even sooner. Um, but so quickly. Um, with that, let's go on to our item of new business, which is a long service line agreement for uh, the Clark property at APM 0770325. Thank you, Chair Mayor, uh, Chair Mayhood. I will ask the district engineer uh, to present this item. Thank you, Rick. This is a fairly straightforward item. We are asking that the board uh, review the, the memo and approve the attached resolution authorizing the district manager to execute a long service line agreement with Ian Clark at APN 0770-3225. The, the applicant, Ian Clark, has applied for water service. They are within our jurisdictional boundaries. We have no problem providing service to them. The only issue is that their property is not contiguous with any of our mains, meaning that a long service line agreement is required. With that, I will take questions. Any questions from members of the board? Uh, Jamie, did you have, or you could raise your hand. Okay, uh, Bob. Um, you know, we've, we've, uh, we really like do well. 
I like doing the long service line agreements because it gets additional customers into the district that maybe otherwise would not be able to. So I very much like to see these come through. Um, I will say though, that I, I, I am uncomfortable um, myself moving forward with this particular item, even though I would like to, because the contract was not attached to the agenda. And we have had in the past um, issues with the long service line agreement. The original one, when I first came on the board, restricted the um, rights of, the, um, uh, of our customer to participate in design discussions going forward. There was also some ambiguity about uh, the termination date uh, and the like. And because of that, I, I, I'm not sure which agreement we have in front of us here. So just as a matter of personal policy, I, I, I need to see contracts if we're voting on them. Um, so I, I'm, I'm personally reluctant to move forward. The rest of the board obviously can, can do so. But I, I find my oversight responsibilities not being able to be fulfilled when I can't see the agreement. And, and I, I don't think the board should be put in that kind of position, at least my, again, my personal opinion, but I don't think that the board should be put in that position. Uh, any other comments by members of the board? Mark? Yes. Um, Rick, who pays for this 750 feet of line? The customer. Okay. And to Bob's earlier point, um, do we have the contract that we would, or the draft contract that we would be issuing uh, to this property owner? available normally we would have it with the agenda item um we just didn't uh if it's not there it's not there okay normally we would have that accompany the uh the memo no, for the okay USB. no it's not there um what uh what repercussions are there if you bring this back to us two weeks from now I'd have to refer to uh, Josh is if this customer may be running out of water or it may not be. Josh, do you have a little update? I don't believe the customer is running out of water. No. Okay. Amy? Then we can, yeah, we can bring it back. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that I, I would uh, think that maybe this is something we could table to bring back when the, the contract is available because I, I do tend to agree. Um, I, you know, be, because of uh, my work uh, with San Jose Water, I, I did it, um, get certified as a rate adjuster. And uh, this issue of, of um, you know, uh, you know, contracts for um, long um, uh, service made agreements, it, it, we should be looking at that as a board before we sign off on it. I, I, I tend to agree with Bob. Okay, then it sounds like we want to table this issue until the next uh, board meeting when it will have the contract with it. Which brings us to uh, the next item of new business, which is the California Low Income Household Water Assistance Program. And the district's finance manager will present this item to the board. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, it is recommended the Board of Directors review the information on the Low Income Household Water Assistance Program, which I will refer to as LEWAP, and approve the district to enter into the direct payment agreement. Um, so the California Department of Community Services and Development has announced the guidelines for the federal LEWAP program. There is $116 million of funding available for qualified low-income households on a first-come, first-served basis. They are offering a $2,000 max one-time payment applied to water or wastewater service costs. Uh, so this program is slightly different than the State Water Resources Control Board Water Arrearages Program that we applied for and already received funding for. Um, a few of the district differences are that with the LEWAP, the low income customer applies. Um, the arrearage period is for any time period and not just for 
um, a specific time frame. The arrearages is for past due bills or property tax rolls. The late fees are covered by the payment. The customers that can apply are low income residential customers. And we, um, we are encouraged to offer payment plans to the customers that are receiving it, which we already do anyways. And the administrative costs are not covered. Um, and so basically the implementation, how it would work is the district would enroll in the direct payment program. Um, the draft agreement has been attached to the agenda item. Uh, this is a required step for to receive funding and to allow our customers the opportunity to participate. Uh, once we are enrolled and sign the agreement, uh, the customer can begin applying in May or in June of 2022. The local service providers will qualify the applicant and submit the application to CSCA. Uh, the, the LSPs, the local service providers, are comprised, comprised of a network of 41 nonprofit and local government agencies. And they basically handle um, all of the outreach to the customers. They assist in helping the customers apply for the program um, and verifying eligibility and identifying the benefit payment amount to CSDA. Um, after the customer is qualified, the CSDA will process payment and the customer records and send those records to Horn. And Horn is the third party um, payment processor that is handling uh, the direct pay to the district. So once you know those records are sent to Horn, they will send us the payment and customer records and we will apply those payments to the customer's accounts. And then we report back to Horn and Horn reports back to the CSD. Uh, so within the, the agenda item, uh, I attach the PDF presentation on the program, the draft direct pay agreement and the LIWAP program guidelines. And I am open to taking questions. Uh, Jamie, we can start with you. Um, I, I think that this is a, a really important step. I um, I don't have any questions about it. I support it. Um, I work for a nonprofit that continues to um, try to backfill and support resources for people who are still economically impacted as a result of the uh, pandemic. And so um, finding ways to support uh, people who need additional assistance right now is still, in, you know, really critical as other um, opportunities to do that uh, dry up. So I, I, I'm, I'm very much in support of this. Okay. Bob? Uh, yes, I mean, I, I think this would be a really uh, great thing. And um, I think we should do that. I did have some questions about a couple of items, Kendra, that were in your presentation. Um, how do the agencies identify who the customers might be that could benefit from this? Do we provide them with that information? No, so they, they reach out to all the um, low income members. And I believe, let me check the guidelines. The low income households are considered 60% state medium income based on the gross income or current recipient of CalFresh, CalWorks, or um, the LAHEAP program. Um, so they, they will reach out to the customer based on that. They will also provide us um, with like advertising uh, information that we can post, you know, on our website and stuff like that. So we get the message out to, you know, customers that do qualify for that. Uh, and on our social media and that kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Yep. Okay. So we're we're uh, I mean, the main thing is we're not providing any information to those agencies ourselves then no. about who the customers are. Okay. Good. No. Um, how much administrative time uh, per customer do we think this is going to take? Because, regrettably, those costs don't sound like they're being covered. So, um, what what is our cost going to be on a per customer basis to process this? Yeah, so the, the one the one difference between this program and um, the water arrearages program 
that we already received funding for is this is a lot less administrative time um, because the customer is the one applying for you know the program and the once they're deemed eligible and we just receive the payment and apply it to the account with the arrearages program we had to you know figure out which customers were in arrearages we had to send all of the information over to the state we had to waive all of the late fees on accounts we had to return any payments so there it was a lot more cumbersome um, for that program this one is basically just we receive the payment we apply it to the account and then we just report back to uh the to csd the uh, accounts that were credited um, I don't have a cost per customer. Um, I could try to figure that out for you, but we also I mean, don't it, really. It, it, it sounds like it's de minimis time, a yeah. few minutes per customer. That's basically all that we all that we need to know. Yeah, exactly. If it was if it was if it was you know a few hours or something, that might be different. But it sounds like it's minutes, so no big yeah. deal. Um, is this considered taxable income to the recipient? That I don't know. Um, I can figure that out. I do know with the um, water arrearages, it was not, um, but I will double check on those. Yeah, I, I, but the water arrearages was a state program, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this I, is federal. Yeah, and, and hopefully it'll be the same thing, but I, I just want to make sure that if it is taxable, the customers are aware of that. If it's not, then that that's great. Uh, hopefully okay. it's not. It would be more logical that it was not. Yeah, you may have some insight into that. Yeah. I will find out. For that. Yeah, and, and I just, I, I don't want to get in the way of that question being answered. I just want to provide a public service disclaimer that we can't give anybody tax. No, advice. right, of course. <laughs> uh, of course, we can't. But somebody that's involved in helping customers need to make sure that, you know, that people aren't surprised when they receive a 1099 for, you know, at the end of the year. Okay, no, let's do it. Okay, uh, Mark, did you have any comments? Um, what, do, what do we estimate the number of ratepayers within uh, the district's um, purview might qualify for this? For, yeah, so this, this came up at the Budget and Finance Committee. Um, we don't really know the number be, just because we don't know, you know, all of our customers' income information. Um, is it is it ten or is it five hundred? Can, can I can I offer some help in that? Sure. So on the Lyra program, when it went through, the estimates that were made by the people that were advocating for the Lyra program, based on the PG and E qualification, was about fifteen hundred. Um, right. I, I thought that might be a little bit high given the changing demographics in our community, but um, it, we are still not a wealthy area by any by any means. Right. So okay. and that 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 was approximately what um, fifteen percent, something like that. Yeah, I want to I want to say one of one of the committee members looked. I don't remember which one exactly, but looked up um, the the percentage and the, I think it was about 20% of our uh, district was, okay. so that's around 1600 customers. So kind of in line with the PG&E. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. That answered my question. That's, that's all I need. Okay. Well, my other questions have been answered already from other board members asking. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, Mark. That's okay, Bob. <laughs> you went first this time and you asked him. Thank you. I'll defer to you next time. Um, no. So can I uh, propose a motion here that uh, we move that the district participate in the low income household water assistance program and authorize the district to enter into a direct pay program agreement. Okay. Can I modify the district manager to enter into that? Or is Kendra, that's why I just said the district because I, 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 I think I think the district does imply the district manager. Well, I, at the risk of getting too technical here, it is important to delegate signature authority to someone, and it could be staff, district staff. But if you just say the district, then the president is the signatory. 
right. The board president is the secretary. So what do you want it to say, Gina? Uh, authorize and direct district staff to enter into the uh, low income household water assistance program agreement. I will second that. Okay. Uh, any questions or comments from members of the public? Uh, Larry. Yeah, uh, Larry Ford Felton. I just want to add my endorsement of this action. Thank you. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Rick. Uh, just one, I think it's important if, if Kendra didn't say that this does not take the place of the Lyra program. This is just another tool in our toolbox. Right. Um, I think that's important. Right. One is for people who pay their bills. <laughs> one is for the group that doesn't. <laughs> so. Or can't. Yeah. All right. Um, any other comments by members of the public? Uh, then uh, can we take a roll call vote, Holly? President Mayhood? Aye. Vice President Ackerman? Yes, and I will be dropping off the call after this. Thank you, everybody, and good night. Good night. Director Fulz? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. Passes unanimously. Uh, next, we have the consent agenda. Does anybody want to pull anything off the consent agenda? No? Then uh, we will go to district reports. Are there any questions from the board on district reports? Bob? Uh, Mark was first. I'm oh, deferring I'm to him. <laughs> go ahead. I saw your hand. Uh, go ahead. We'll get everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, on the uh, operations department report, uh, it references uh, the badger meters and the replacement of those, uh, specifically on page 118 of the agenda. Uh, I see that uh, 24, 54 meters have been replaced in 66 months. I, I calculate leaving another. Uh, almost a little more than 5,000 to replace at that rate. It's going to take us another 10 to 12 years to replace all of these. Well, that's the thing with the meter replacement program is that it is a continuous thing. Once you get to the end of the system, you begin again. And how long are these meters? Um, I don't know if accurate or uh, life expectancy. Accurate or, or, uh, yeah, what's our life expectancy? So the meters that we took out of our system for the California Drive and the Fern and Reynolds uh, mainline replacements, those meters all came back 100% accurate. Well, 99% accurate. There was only one that failed out of all of them, and they were the age of those. And we did an age test too that we were or we were directed to do. We went and pulled some of the oldest meters in the system at one time. Mm -hmm. And that was presented to the board at one time, too. And those meters also came back 99% accurate. And some of those meters were, correct me if I'm wrong, Rick, 20 years old? At least. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. right. So doing this across that time period is uh, reasonable then from a... Uh, I, I do believe they're guaranteed uh, accurate for 15 years. The new right. Okay. Yeah. And one of the different one of the differences is between our systems and other systems is our surface water. Mm -hmm. Our surface water is not corrosive, doesn't beat up the meters. Okay. And yeah. those systems that have just well water, yeah, their meters are going to go out way sooner. Okay. All right. That's all the questions I have on it. And um, I'm sorry that that was a brief. It seemed very brief, but that's all I could really come up with to do is give you the numbers. That's that's what I was looking for. Perfect. I, I mean, if we were doing a level amount of meters every year with a 15-year lifespan, we'd be doing about 550 more or less meters a year. Yeah. Um, and, and again, you know, my thing is you don't want to be doing spikes in your capital expenditures because that just makes 
things really yeah. hard. A service business needs to operate level as much right. as possible. Um, I did have a, a question, uh, James. Periodically, I like to ask this because sometimes we have new new people watching. But on your um, on your well drawdown reports, um, could you sort of briefly explain um, what folks should be looking at relative to uh, pump set uh, depth, screen um, area, et cetera, and how oh, these are all consistent? Let me get to that page real quick. What page is that, Bob? Uh, that starts on page 127. All right, I'm looking at my screen here. I know. Uh, 127, you said? Yeah, that's that's the start of your drawdown report. Okay. One second. 126, I got. So the pump set level is at 237 feet on. So I'm at Quail four, Well 4A, which is the pump set is at 237 feet. And Everything above, the, uh, all those marks above it means the water level is above that 237 feet. So the 175, we have, uh, uh, yeah, so 60, let me, 62 feet. We have 62 feet of water above the pump set. So let me, let me sort of help here. As long as the water level stays above the pump set, we're good. Does it matter about the screen area? No, because the screen area, what that does, it just, just cascades water down to the pump. And okay. then the pump goes. So the screen area is the casing, not the pipe that pumps the water out. The pipe that pumps the water out is inside the casing. The screen area is the casing. So it cascades water down to the pump. And then it pumps it up the actual pipe that goes up the middle of the case. So basically on all these um, items, since we are um, uh, above the pump set level, we're all safe at this point relative to a, the, a good operation of the, of the pump. Yeah, we're doing pretty well in our well fields. Um, and that's another thing, surface water saves us on that. We get to replenish our aquifer. Um, and some of these readings that are on here, we have to mark them like on Quail Well 4A, that reading that's down at the pump set level is more than likely not a true reading because you can see where we're at everywhere. You know, we never get down that low. So something was a ray there, I would imagine, but we can't say that it wasn't the reading. Is so there any? Go ahead. Yeah, are there any kind of um, new electronic? Um, uh, features available to give you more accurate readings that we could be taking advantage of? Well, and we have advanced to those. I mean, those readings are back in 2012, 2013. We're always advancing. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I wanted to get back to the badger meter thing, Bob, on your 550 a uh, year. And so we're planning to meet that again this year. So we should be at about 3,200 meters by the end of the year. We're put, making a big push through the summertime, and that's the time when we want to change meters. Yeah, I, I know at one point in time we did a um, – uh, we did, we looked at sort of age of meters, quantity, that sort of thing, and, and yeah. sort of – I think this was about three years ago or so where right. we were looking at, well, how what would it take to catch up? And then once you catch up, just doing, you know, 500 a year, boom, 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 every year forever, basically. Or if they last longer than 15 years – whatever that new periodicity is. And I guess we'll find out in 10 or 15 years how good the batch readers are right. with, respect to their, with respect to their life. Sometimes the newer stuff, you know, appliances don't last as long as they used to, and you never know about the uh, the new stuff, right? Well, the mechanics of the batch meter, I can say, is advanced, and it's much better than the census, and the census lasted as long as they have. Well, that's good. Hopefully they'll last 20 or 25 years, and we can – reduce the number of meters we replace every year uh, after we get, understand that. Staff That's great. Love that. No, I, I, I hear you on that. <laughs> the big worry is going to be battery life, and that's what we hope that we get, the long battery life, because these are all the, the smart yep. readout meters. And it seems that with census and especially the Felton meters, Neptune, battery life was half of what it was rated at. 
Right, and our battery life on the Badgers right now is 10 years. So we will have to change endpoints before we have to change meters. Okay, I have a question from the public. Cynthia? Can we, um, thank you. Go ahead, Cynthia. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to point out that the Badger meters make it possible for the customers to use the ion water feature. Isn't that true? So there is an incentive to um, speed up the installation of the Badger meters so that customers have more control over their own water usage. So the, that is true, but in our mountainous terrain, it's not all customers. There is a few pocket spots that people don't get their actual usage for the month until their read comes in that is manually taken. Thank you. Bob? I also had a comment on that. Um, I mean, I think within the context of how our community is doing on water usage, we are head and shoulders above, you know, national averages, state averages, and that sort of thing. When you look at the uh, water use um, in the winter time, for example, indoor water use uh, divided by our population, we're we're somewhere in the 35 to 42 gallons uh, per day per per uh, per person. That is significantly below the state um, uh, the, the the state the goal of 50. And I, I think we, um, you know, we sort of need to recognize that the, the bigger issue is how to deal with leaks. And I think our leak adjustment program is, um, is very robust in, in that regard. Kendra, you have your hand up? Yeah, I just wanted to add on to James's um, comment about the one, the meters that only read, we still can only read every 30 days. Um, when we do import them back in from the website, it will show on those meters if a leak is detected. And what we're able to do is go back out and extract the 90 day usage history. Um, and so we'll be able to, pin, we can pinpoint like where a leak would start or whatnot. Um, but we do, we are able to have that feature. So that is sometimes helpful um, in showing the a leak that came through. I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Okay. Good add. Yes, uh, thank you. I think uh, that we are to the end of our agenda. Then. And uh, if there are no objections, I will uh, adjourn. Hearing none, seeing none, we are off. Uh, did, 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 Is that um, a wave good night, I hope? No, 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 sorry. Just one question. Did we get in touch with uh, Christine? Uh, yes. I think Christina Wise wanted to talk with Rick. We're good there. Um, I emailed her, but we haven't met up. Um, okay. So I don't think we're good there yet. I, okay. I responded to her. I emailed her as well, but I didn't, I haven't uh, touched bases with her on the phone yet. Okay, great. Thank you. I, I emailed her and she and gave her some thoughts, but she never got back to me. Okay. Um, I will now declare this meeting adjourned. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Cedric, that is a...